Good morning, Woodbury Church of the Brethren, and all of you who have chosen to join us here in worship this morning, we're glad that you're with us. Although it doesn't really feel like it, this is our Palm Sunday worship. And then normally on Palm Sunday, uh, that would mean our children parading around the sanctuary with, with palm leaves while the congregation sings. And then later the adult choir would provide a, a wonderful message in music. Watching this morning, you, you pretty much got the pastor's David, Scott Emil. I realize that might be a little disappointing, but we do have a little bit of a surprise later that will hopefully make things better for you. I also wanted to let you know that if you're the kind of person who likes taking notes during the message or, or you'd like to work with an outline, there is one available on our website. Just go to woodburycob.org, hit the, hit the media tab, and underneath that you should find the outline. It's either in Word format or a PDF. Well, let's begin our worship this morning by joining our hearts and hopefully voices in victory in Jesus.
Let's pray. God, we uh, we still stand in awe of you and your um, your infiniteness, God. Um, that, that even while we're not meeting together, God, that you're meeting with each and every one of us um, in, in the comfort of our own homes um, or still in our pajamas. God, I just thank you that uh, you do care for each and every one of us and uh, that, that you will meet with us. So God, I just pray that we would open our hearts and our minds to you and that you would come and uh, you would dwell with us. In Jesus' name, amen.
we are so grateful to be able to come into your presence this morning. We know that wherever we are, you are there. Wherever we are, our hearts can be united before you. We come to you, Lord, in adoration. We love you, Lord. You are, you are the great and mighty God of the universe. Yet you, you loved us so much, you continue to love us so much, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins, that through him we might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We, we proclaim that you are our Lord and our God, you are our master, you are our king, you are the ones to whom our hearts are devoted. You are the one who we want to serve with all of our hearts and all of our lives. We also come to you in confession, Heavenly Father. First of all, we confess that you are God and that we are not. You are in charge. You are in control. We are not. We also confess, Heavenly Father, that too often we fail you. That we allow things into our lives, particularly in the way of thoughts and attitudes, of desires, of preferences, that are not in line with your will and your word. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your grace and your mercy. We ask that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that you would lead us and guide us in your way, that we might follow you faithfully, that we might be the people that you've called us to be, that that love which we have proclaimed would be lived out in our lives and that you would be honored and glorified. We come to you in thanksgiving. While things are, are somewhat out of control in our world and, and we, we are dealing with the constraints of, of, of being in our homes and, and not having our, our normal activities and our normal travels, we recognize that even in the midst of that, we are incredibly blessed people. We have food. We have shelter. We have ways of communicating with each other even when we can't meet in person. We have the, the gift of family. We have the blessing of our church family, of, of brothers and sisters in Christ not only in our own church, but in, in churches around us, in, in this great brotherhood that is your kingdom. We're thankful for, for your healing power. While we tend to focus on all those who are, are having the most significant symptoms and those who are dying, there are so many, so many more who are not because you are seeing them through. And we thank you and praise you for that. We pray for a, a successful surgery and return home, even in our own congregation. And I'm sure for each one of us, we can look to family and friends and see your healing and your presence and your power at work. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all of your blessings. And we do also come before you with the needs and concerns that are on our hearts. And there are, are so many in this particular time. We pray for those who have been so seriously hit by this virus. Those who are, are having difficulty breathing, those who are, are, are literally fighting for their lives. We pray for your healing, sustaining power to be upon them. We pray for, for the doctors and nurses who are, are putting their lives at risk in, in treating uh, this, this situation and, and the frustration that comes from not having the right answers and, and not having all the equipment and, and not having the things at their disposal that they need. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would lift them up and encourage them and bless them. We pray for the first responders, for the 
for the EMTs, for the police, for the, the firemen, and, and so on, who are also putting themselves at risk to meet needs, to care for those in their community, to transport people, again, knowing the risk involved. And Lord, we, we thank you for, for even the, the, the workers in the food industry and, and, and those who, who provide the medicines, the, the truckers and those who, who make the deliveries, all of these people who, who stay open and stay on the job and stay at work so that we can have the things that we need. We pray for them. We pray for their safety and, and their protection and for your presence with them. We pray for those who struggle with the economics of this whole situation, those who, who are, are, are losing jobs, those who, who don't know how they're going to be able to, to make their, their rent payment or their house payment or, 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 or buy food for them and their children. There are many in, in that place, Heavenly Father. And we pray for each of these as well. And, and, and Lord, not just for those that we've mentioned in our own country, but those around the world who are dealing with this. Lord, we, we really pray, we really reach out to you that you would hear the prayers of your people and, and that you would intervene and that you would, would lessen the impact, that you would stop this pandemic in its tracks. That would be our prayer. That would be our, our hope. But Lord, we also pray, we also hope that in this time of trouble and difficulty and uncertainty, that hearts and lives would be reaching out to you. That, that those who have maybe never considered a need for a God, a Savior, a Lord, a Deliverer, might realize just how much they need Jesus in their lives. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that when this, when this whole thing is, is through, when it is done, that honor and glory would be given to you for seeing us through. And Lord, we pray for us as your people, that as we walk even in these times, that our faith, our trust, our love for you would be evident, that we might be witnesses, continue to be witnesses for you, in a dark, dark world. Have your way, Lord, in our lives. Guide and direct in this service. Teach us your word and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning we'll be reading from John 14, 6 and John 1, 14 through 17. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 1, 14 through 17 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Good morning. Back in the 1980s and 90s, there was a professional boxer named Carl Williams. And he was billed as the truth, Carl the Truth Williams. He had a successful amateur career, 22 wins, one loss. He was described as a natural, no doubt about it, and as punching like a cruise missile. As a professional, he won 30 fights, lost 10, and had one ruled a no contest. From June of 1987 to March of 1991, he held the USBA heavyweight title. I think that was a point in time where there were a number 
uh, heavyweight champions, depending on which boxing federation you bought into. But his most famous fights were a controversial loss by de decision to Larry Holmes in a world heavyweight title fight, a split decision to Tim Weatherspoon, which cost him his USBA title, and a first round knockout loss to Mike Tyson. After his retirement from boxing, he worked as a security agent and field supervisor at the World Trade Center. After the September 11 attacks, he worked as security for a number of different firms. Sadly, he died in 2013 at the age of 53 from esophageal cancer. He is said also to be the inspiration for a parody character on Fox's Living Color, Carl the Tooth Williams, played by Jamie Foxx, a boxer so named because he only had one tooth. So what made Carl Williams the truth? Was he something special as a boxer? Was he the real thing, the, the genuine article? We throw the world word truth around rather liberally, often without thinking of the real meaning or, or any deeper meaning to it. Sometimes I don't think we put much stock in even the basic concept of the truth. We fact check political debates, news reports, and press conferences. We find out that virtually everyone is playing fast and loose with the truth, and we seem to just accept it. We hold no one responsible. Jesus' words for us today are, I am the truth. It's part of the trilogy along with I am the way, which we talked about last week, and I am the life, which I hope we will talk about next week on Easter Sunday. This statement gets very little attention. Commentators seem to brush right past it, past it without any comment. Even Jesus' words surrounding this passage seem to apply more to Jesus as the way than either the truth or the life. So what are we to, to make from Jesus' statement, I am the truth? What does Jesus want us to understand about him from these words? Our, our definitions of the English word don't help much. According to dictionary.com, truth is the true or actual state of a matter, conformity with fact or reality, a verified or indisputable fact, proposition, principle, or the like, the state or character of being true, actuality or actual existence, an obvious or accepted fact, truism. While each of these probably relate to Jesus in some way, they're really not very helpful at all. Looking into the Greek word what was a little more helpful. Vine lists two main definitions, objectively signifying the reality lying at the basis of an appearance, the manifested veritable essence of a matter. Subjectively, truthfulness, truth, not merely verbal, but sincerity and integrity of character. He adds, the meaning is not merely ethical truth, but truth in all its fullness and scope as embodied in him, him referring to Jesus. He was the perfect expression of the truth. Strong adds truth as personal excellence, free from pretense, simulation, falsehood, deceit. So even in the Greek, we begin to understand that Jesus is more than just fact versus fiction. He's more than just a true statement versus a lie. He's even more than just real and genuine versus fake and counterfeit. He's the manifestation of truth, the essence of the matter. He is sincerity and integrity of character and the perfect embodiment of truth. As we look at this concept of truth as it's used in scripture, we find he is even more. Now, there are roughly 230 uses of the word truth in the NIV Bible. 82 of these are found in Psalms, many of them from David, but not all, and in the writings of John, his, his gospel and his letters. Many of the other uses are pretty much as we found them in the English de definitions that we looked at earlier. Repeatedly in all four Gospels, we find Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, as he teaches his disciples and the masses. 
But here in this upper room with his disciples, Jesus isn't saying, I tell you the truth. He's not saying, I have great life truths to share with you. Or even, I have access to many truths through my Father. He is saying, I am the truth. As we look at these passages in the Psalms and in the writings of John, I think we find deeper meaning to this word truth that will help us to understand Jesus as the truth. Let's start with the truth in Psalms. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God and my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. This is David, and he relates truth to guidance and teaching. He wants to see God's ways more clearly. He re relates this to his hope in God as well. Then in Psalm 86, verse 11, David writes, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. This is one of a number of psalms that talk about walking in truth. Truth is not something to, to be heard and debated. It's not something to be jotted down for future reference. It's not for just for meditation and, and mental gymnastic. It's to be walked in. It's to be lived out on a daily basis in the ordinary events of our lives. I know right now nothing is ordinary at the moment. The world's a fruitcake and we're all, we're all going nuts. But the truth, God's truth, Jesus Christ as the truth, should still be impacting every moment and every facet of our lives. Jesus relates this to an undivided heart, a heart with one goal and purpose, a heart that does not seek God's truth on one hand and fall for Satan, Satan's lies on the other. A heart that is devoted to God alone, not self-seeking, not, not seeking self-satisfaction at the same time. In chapter 40, verse 11, we read, Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. David's relating truth along with love to God's protection. Certainly, God's word, the, the teachings of Jesus, the, the inspired writings, form a hedge of protection for those who follow Jesus and who live by those words. But I think, I think David is saying something more. And certainly, Jesus as the truth is our protection. Because Jesus is a personification of the truth. And all the things that we've talked about to this point, he is our rock and our fortress. Everyone is looking for protection at the moment. Protective equipment, or the lack of it, is the hot topic on virtually every news report. And I'm not suggesting by this that as Jesus followers, we will be spared from the coronavirus, that we don't need to exercise caution and follow guidelines that are also there for our protection. Yes, the Israelites were spared from the impact of some of the plagues that ravaged the Egyptians, but we're also told that God sends rain on the just and the unjust. I am suggesting again that we continue to follow Jesus and God's truth and allow him to work out his plan for our lives, even in the midst of this pandemic. The last reference I want to look at is Psalm, in Psalms is Psalm 43, 3. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God. To God, my joy and my delight, I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. This is not David, but again, the writer points to truth as a guide. And not just to anywhere but to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. He refers to the altar of God as my joy and my delight. He envisions a time of worship and praise at, the, at that altar. Reminds me of our discussion last week of Jesus as the way, the way to the Father, the way to a home in heaven. Again, 
It's not just fact versus fiction or a true statement as opposed to a lie. This is a far greater manifestation of the truth. Jesus, as the truth, is the way to the Father and his dwelling place. Jesus, as the truth, is our guide and the way to the place that he's prepared for us. To recap these few references in Psalms, we see truth as guide and teacher. We see truth as something to be walked out and to be walked in and followed. We see truth as our protection. And we see the truth as our way to the throne of God and our place with him. So let's move on to the idea of truth in the writings of John. John is the only gospel writer who records Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it seems obvious that as he sat down to write his gospel, that these, that these words, along with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, greatly impacted what he wrote. I want to start in the very first chapter, John 1, verses 14 and 17. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. For the Jews, the law of Moses was their truth. The law, the rituals that accompanied it, the feast and the sacrifices were their reality. But Jesus brought a whole different truth. Not that he abolished the law, he fulfilled it. But Jesus' truth is not linked to the law, it's linked to grace. He was full of grace and truth. Grace and truth came through him. In John 3, 21, Jesus tells us, But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may, plain, may be seen plainly that what he has done has been through God. Here the truth brings light. It exposes what is done through God and exposes what is evil, what comes through Satan. So we seek to live by the truth or, or in the truth. The easiest way for me to think about this is that I need to live in Jesus and Jesus needs to live in me. He is the truth that brings me into the light and exposes the reality of my heart. In John 8, 31 and 32, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What does it mean to know the truth and for the truth to set us free? Oh, we love to get to the facts of a matter, especially if it's juicy stuff that's, that's floating around out there about our friends or neighbors. If we're going to share it with others, we want to have all the facts. And if it's true, that's not gossip, right? wrong that kind of truth doesn't set anyone free one phrase that we've heard a lot lately on the news is facts oh not fear which sounds great but a lot depends on how the facts are, pre are presented or what facts are presented we hear about the rising number of cases reported and the number of deaths we hear about the places where resources are scarce and, and health care workers are, are overwhelmed. We rarely hear about the masses who are surviving, or those with mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, or, or the many places where few cases have been confirmed. Do the facts presented set us free from fear? I don't think so. However, when we know Jesus' truth, when we know him as Savior and Lord, when we are communicating with him daily and experiencing the peace that only he can give, then we can be set free from fear and from the many other things that plague our lives. From John's letters, 1 John 3, verses 9, verse 19. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Is John talking about belonging to a set of facts or a particular doctrine or truism? I don't think so. I think ultimately, ultimately this belonging is to the one who is the truth. When we belong to Jesus, when, we're submitted, when we've submitted ourselves to him, then and only then are our hearts at rest in his presence. This is the peace with God that comes 
as we are reconciled to him through Jesus. Lastly, let's take a look at the truth according to Jesus. We've, we've already done some of this, but I want to look more at just, just two of Jesus' teachings. Also in John's Gospel, also on the night of his arrest. In John 17, verses 15 through 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is praying for the protection and the sanctification of his disciples. And the two key words here are truth and word. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What truth and what word is Jesus talking about? Again, the truth and God's word to the Jews was the Old Testament scriptures. Is that what would protect his disciples and help them to grow in their walk with him, which is basically what sanctification is? In John's Gospel, beginning in the very first verses, Jesus is referred to as both the Word and the truth. So here again, I believe that he is our protection, not just in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, as we work to progress in our walk with him. And then in John 14 and, and 16, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit to come. If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then in John 16, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Sometime after, after Jesus told them that he was the truth, he told his disciples about this Holy Spirit who would come after he left and after he had returned to his Father. The Holy Spirit was going to come and be with them and live with them forever. And Jesus refers to him as the spirit of truth. The grand confession of our faith acknowledges that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, Jesus Christ. So if Jesus is the truth, the spirit that comes after him, that proceeds from him, must be the spirit of truth. The spirit will guide us into the truth by continually referring us back to Jesus. He, he's not revealing new truth. He's drawing upon the fullness of God's truth embodied in Jesus Christ. So if we're going to be, if we're going to access and walk in the truth of Jesus, the spirit of truth, truth must be at work in our lives and we must be following his lead. So again, Jesus is more than facts and being correct. He is more even than sincerity or integrity of character. He's more than just the real thing, the genuine article, the essence of the matter. He is the fullness of all truth. He's the embodiment of the truth that characterizes our Father God. The philosophers, the, the sages, the religions of this world may have their nuggets of truth here and there. The scientists may have their wealth of facts, but Jesus alone is the truth. So he must be our guide, and we must walk in his truth. His truth is our protection and our path to the Father. He is the truth that sets us free and allows us to have peace in his presence. His spirit allows us to grow in him and leads us into truth. Perhaps the, the saddest question in all of Scripture, to me, is found in John 18, verses 37 through 38. And it's not the question itself, but the circumstances surrounding it. Jesus is standing before Pilate, presumably awaiting judgment. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. 
With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate asks a great question, one that sages and, and philosophers and, and many people have asked throughout the ages, a question with far-reaching consequences in every area of our life. And he asks it of a great person, the perfect person, the one and only person actually qualified to give him an answer. But he walked away without waiting for an answer. He went back to negotiating with the Jews, knowing that there was no basis for a charge against Jesus, no reason to put him to death, yet that's exactly where these negotiations would lead. Are you looking for the truth? Are you looking for integrity? Are you looking for someone who is real and genuine to follow? Are you looking for protection and freedom and peace with God? Are you looking for a guide to show you the way to God, to his throne and the place where he dwells? Jesus can not only give you the answer, Jesus is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Be grateful. Heavenly Father, I think we all seek for the truth. We all want what is, what is real and genuine. We want the answers. We want a guide for this life. We want a way to the life of God. Praise God that you have given us Jesus. And he is that way. He is that life. He is that truth. I just pray if there's anyone hearing this message who has not found you as truth and life as Savior and Lord, that they might reach out to you today claim you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for those who believe. Amen.